April 13th, the little resort and railroad town of Keddy in remote Plumas County hit the headlines. The county awoke with horror that Monday morning. There had been committed there a crime so bizarre it should have happened in the big city. Indeed, it was the reason most Keddy residents had moved to the country to escape crime. On that spring day, then Plumas County Sheriff Doug Thomas found the bodies of 36-year-old Glenna Sharp, her 16-year-old son John, his 17-year-old friend Dana Wingate. They had been knifed and claw hammered to death. November 1980 is when we moved into Keddy in the small cabin, which was number 28. Rick Gregg slept in one room. My mom, Tina, and I slept in another room. And Johnny, there was a basement downstairs, and he, since he was the eldest, he got to sleep down there. Johnny had scruffy, blonde, I think dirty blonde hair, he had blue eyes, and he was small like the rest of us, but um, don't get me wrong, he made up in that he was very, very feisty, and I think that night, that's what happened to him, is he was defending the family, which he, you know, he would do at any cost, he always stuck up for me at school or wh wherever for any of us. And I think that's what happened that night as he was defending mom and Tina and the rest of the family. The scene was horrible beyond belief as Sheila Sharp looked through the window of her mother's house in Ketty, California. Inside on the living room floor lay the corpses of her mother, her brother, and his friend. All had been tortured and viciously murdered. The bodies remained bound and gagged. Dead were 36-year-old Glenna Sharp, the mother of five. Her son, 15-year-old John Sharp, a student at Quincy High School. His friend from school, 17-year-old Dana Wingate, no one is quite sure what happened on that April night in 1981, but police investigators believe the two boys may have been picked up by the suspects as they hitchhiked home from Quincy, seven miles away. The two boys were laying uh, prone on the floor, um, had been tied up, and, uh, and then on the couch was uh, Sue. <laughs> mother was the type who had a lot of men friends, um, constant comings and goings as I understand it. You know, everyone knew that, that the family was on welfare and, and in those days that was not a popular thing to have happen to you here in Plumas County. And so you immediately had sort of a stigmatism attached to you. You know, there were a lot of rumors at the time about, you know, my gosh, the way she deals drugs, it could be anybody, you know, it could have been a big drug party that got out of hand. Some of the rumors dealt with her sleeping with, with various men for money. My aunt, when she was murdered, was my age now and she was a single mother of five children. And she had two teenagers, a preteen, and then two small boys. And she uprooted her family, moved here to be near family, my dad, 
and try to make the best of what she could with the skills she had. I didn't feel any better about Sue then because I just felt like she should, I was very judgmental and thought she should have been a better mother. And I wouldn't let my kids go over there, but I was welcomed her kids over to our house and wanted them to be there and be safe. But I, uh, the night it happened, they wanted Paula to stay the night and I wouldn't let her stay. And I just felt like my kids didn't belong over there. My aunt of all people, my cousin, uh, Johnny, my aunt Sue, Dana and Tina, they were nobody. They weren't people that were harassing the shopkeepers in Quincy. I don't believe they were the neighbors that were creating discontent among the neighborhood. They're very, they kept to themselves. Nobody knew them, they weren't notorious. Yet out of the blue, those four people were murdered in this town. It changed the face of, of Plumas County because nothing had ever happened before. And, and because nothing like that had ever happened before, it made people a little scared and a little suspicious. And, and I've been here 30 years, and after that happened, I, I don't pick up hitchhikers anymore unless I know them. Yeah, my mom's uh, still sending me articles in the paper she sees about the Katie murders. It was uh, a real upset up here, and uh, uh, everyone, uh, it still, still feels bad about the whole situation, and uh, I can't believe she still, every time she sees something in the paper, she'll send me up an article about it, and uh, I'm still, would like to get to the bottom of this one, you know. It made the area just less innocent than it was before. It, it was like nothing was ever the same after that. It didn't just affect Keddie, it affected all of Quincy all of our county because uh, who would have thought that this, something this horrific could have happened in a, a small uh, mountain community like this. It's God's country. Dana, you know, was, uh, he was born prematurely. I, I believe, you know, my memory sets me right, uh, I think seven and a half months. Right from the start, he, you know, we had troubles uh, physically with him. And that carried on through his years, even as uh, becoming a teenager. Uh, through those years of Dana, you know, and the whole family, I worked a lot, you know, and so it was a joke that none of my kids knew me. <laughs> who's who's that? No, that's your father. And we used to take Dana and um, dress him up in our and Renee's clothes and. He had longer hair because that was the style back then. And we would braid up his hair and put makeup on him. And my dad would get so mad because there was three girls and one boy, so he wanted his son. And we would try to make him look like us. And then we'd say, go, smile, Peaches, smile. And then we would all laugh. And, um, and he was just precious. Dana was... Uh... I think more and more he felt the distance, you know, and he became more and more interested in being outside of the family, you know, staying away. And my girls are always staying at home. And he, as, as I look back at it, you know, he was spending more time out of the house uh, with friends and all that. My wife and I operated a receiving home for the county of Plumas during the time that we were there, 
Dana Wingate became one of our um, clients. Living in the group home, Dana had the responsibility of, of keeping my wife and I informed of where he was at all times. So true to his responsibility, he came to the house on the afternoon of the terrible incident that occurred and he and Johnny asked if Dana could go to Johnny's that evening and, and spend the night. And with the proviso, my wife insisted that they not hitchhike down to the seven miles to Keddy. But as we know now, that's exactly what they ended up doing. The next morning, uh, at about 10 o'clock in the morning or so, we got a call from the police and they asked us to come to the mortuary to identify a body. And uh, we went down and they were very nice to us, uh, told us what to expect. And, and uh, we went in and much to our dismay, the body was that of Dana. I believe there was something um, to do with the, the mother. I believe that. I, I, I mean, to be that brutal with these people, you know, I'm, something was going on. Even though this event uh, happened over 20 years ago, Dana has been with me and with my, the rest of my family and with the other kids that were in that home. During that entire time, I've talked to some of the others and, and they recall what they feel about Dana and there just is no end to this. It goes on and on and on. We don't feel like we have to quit living or live in that past, but it's always with us. When I went over to Alicia's that night, um, to spend the night, I didn't know where Tina was, she could have been outside playing or, you know, at the house, who, who knows at this time. Um, I do know that she wanted to spend the night, but Alicia and I wanted it just to be the older girls, nobody else. You know, we were being stingy, I guess. I remember Tina and Sheila coming over and, and uh, she, she was going to stay all night with my daughter, Alicia. And Tina wanted to stay and she stayed every Saturday night and so I just thought it would be really nice if Sheila uh, stayed by herself that night. Tina was just beautiful. She had blonde hair that was kind of shoulder length and kind of unkept, but it was, it looked good. You know, it was kind of like she was a free spirit, if you will. She had these incredible, huge blue eyes that kind of overpowered her whole self. I mean, that's what captured you when you looked at her. You didn't see really her hair or anything like that. You were just captivated by her eyes. I remember Tina as being a little bit slow at school. She was in special ed education classes and um, that's all I can relate to her being slow because she was a normal kid to me. As a student, Tina was um, not at grade level. Uh, she was in a special ed class and getting extra help. I would help her one-on-one, -on -one, but she really didn't get the, the help, help that she needed at home. She was um, struggling with everything, um, but she was one of the sweetest, nicest little girls I think I've ever had. When I walked in the house that morning, um, what I saw was a person 
right at the door with their hands and feet tied. I dropped all my, I guess I had sleeping bag clothes right there and ran back to the Seabolts where I was staying the night the night before. She was back in just a few minutes and she was just screaming and, and crying hysterically. She says, my God, there's three dead people in my house. Uh, and she didn't know who they were. And uh, I ran across the street to the, we didn't have a phone, and I ran across to the people that owned the house, at the, uh, owned Keddy at the time, and, and I uh, had them call the sheriff. One of the things I did see as well was a knife, which I thought at the time was a pocket knife, and come to find out it was a bent steak knife that they had used on, I don't know if all of them or one of them. After the police were called, we then ran back next to my house to the side window where Rick, Greg, and Justin were sleeping and got them out through the window. Um, I did not want them to see what I saw and who knows if somebody else was still in the house at the time. Uh, apparently the, the bodies are pretty hard to tell who's, you know, they were bashed in so bad or something to that effect. What amazes me is that the kids sleeping in the bedroom didn't hear a thing. How can that be? There's a very good chance that I had uh, witnessed something, um, whether it be the crime itself or the aftermath. The morning after the crime had occurred, I after the police arrived, I was being interviewed by Doug Thomas, and we, he, he conducted the interview inside of his patrol car, uh, probably because it was raining out and we didn't want to be exposed to the elements. I had made several remarks in, in reference to where is Tina, Tina's missing, and the sheriff or the detective was not acknowledging any of the statements that I was uh, saying um, and it, he actually had to be interrupted by my mother and told will you be quiet for a moment and listen to what this person what this boy is telling you he is telling you that Tina is missing what Justin was saying was no, that is not Tina in there. That's Sue in there. And to go look for Tina, Tina's missing. He kept saying that over and over, Tina's missing. We're trying to locate Tina. We believe that uh, she's an integral part of this and that she may be the clue that we're looking for. Uh, she's a girl of 12 years of age with uh, shoulder length hair. Um, it's dark blonde in color and she has light blue eyes. She's very slightly built, uh, and one would maybe mistake her for a nine-year-old. Are you going on the assumption that she has been kidnapped or run away? Well, we know that she was in the residence, and at this point we have to go into the assumption that uh, the assailant or assailants uh, took her with them. I just assumed that somebody took her because she was so, so pretty, and that they just wanted her to be their own. I mean, I had no idea at that time. I was so naive. Um, that anything horrible could happen, but I just figured, you know, they wanted her so badly that they would do anything to have her. When the um, Keddy murders happened, Tina was not found. They didn't know where she was. And um, I went out looking for her. Um, I always thought that if she were alive, she would come to me. She knew where I lived, she knew I cared about her, and uh, she never came. So I was out tramping around in the mountains, and I'd get in my car, and I'd go down the, I'd go down the canyon, and I'd go into all the little uh, roads and streets, down, or roads down there, uh, just seeing if I could find something. Um, I still can't go down the canyon without thinking about Tina. 
For Plumas County, the Ketty murders were indeed a shock. After all, this county only has 17,000 people, only 33 sworn officers. And at one point, one-fifth of those investigators were working on the Ketty murder and kidnap. Politics played a big role in, in the whole thing. Uh, we had a, a sheriff that uh, was trying to make probably more of a name for himself and rather than uh, relying on a, the expertise of the Department of Justice when it first started out. Uh, he tried to do things himself and uh, I think hurt the case quite a bit. We, we collected evidence uh, from throughout the room and from throughout the house, actually. Anything that we could uh, believe that had a connection with the homicides. We even tore, uh, tore some panels off the wall uh, because there was blood there. And uh, then all of that was sent to the Department of Justice in Sacramento uh, for analyzation. The most kind of strange thing for me was that the walls forward and backward uh, of that room had had knife marks like somebody had been throwing a knife trying to stick it in the wall at the time I had been uh, using hypnosis I had gone to two different training sessions to learn hypnosis uh, to get recall from witnesses. We took Justin and, and put him under hypnosis and uh, under hypnosis Justin uh, didn't actually say that he saw anything but he described watching Love Boat and, uh, and then in detail uh, talked about the fight and uh, talked about Sue and talked about uh, at the end that Sue was thrown overboard. I had indicated uh, body placements um, which were, from what I understand, very close to being correct, if not correct. Uh, he heard the loud noises, the scuffles, the, the noises that were being uh, you know, made in the living room, and that he was probably peeking out from behind the bedroom door. Police artists have drawn these composite sketches of the two suspects. If you know anything about these murders or recognize the men in these drawings, call 1-800-78-CRIME. Help put these men behind bars. They are two of California's most wanted. When I saw the composites, I did see my ex-husband in those composites as well as a man that he had met over in the VA mental hospital. Now these, these are the pictures that came out in the newspaper of the people they thought had done the murder or committed the murder and we had noticed that if you took the top half of one guy and put it with the bottom half of the other guy's face and it was almost a carbon copy of Bo and Marty. And this is what, what it would look like on one and kind of like that on the other one. Mm -hmm. Martin Smart lived uh, just around the corner, uh, like maybe uh, three houses away, two to three houses, but just around the corner. And uh, Bo was a friend of his, and it's my understanding that they had met at the VA hospital. Um, and developed a friendship. And of course, the night of the homicide, they had visited the, uh, the bar in the hotel, and uh, people just were suspicious of them. He wanted to stop in and see if Sue would go down to the lounge with us. And I tried to tell him no, that he, she wouldn't go. She doesn't drink, she's not that way. And he said, well, Bo needs a partner. And I said, well, she won't go. And he insisted, you go and talk, you go ask her. And so I said, well, okay, okay, I'll go ask her. But she won't go. And I did. I went and asked. And she didn't want to go. And so they were both upset about that. I, I did wake up. It was 
Oh, it had to have been probably two in the morning or so. And I heard noise and I did get up and I went to the bedroom door and I saw them burning something in the wood stove. Well, Marty had went to Reno the day after the murder and he come home about five, six o'clock. It, like, it was in the afternoon and he was real high on something. And he kept saying, well, I gotta go to Ketty. I gotta go to Ketty. And I'd say, Marty, you don't need to go to Ketty. Somebody's out there killing somebody and you don't need to be going. And he says, well, I gotta go. And he was walking up and down the room, up and down the room. He says, I gotta go. There's something I, I, I gotta finish, something I started that had to be finished. I've got to go finish it. And I kept arguing with him and saying, Marty, you don't need to go. I'll take you in the morning. But he kept saying that over and over. I got to go back. I got to go there. Something I got to finish. Something I started. Something I got to, I got to finish. I have to go. And I finally talked to him about nine o'clock at night. I talked him into staying. He says, okay. He said, uh, I'll stay. But all that evening, he was just walk, just like a caged animal, walking up and down, up and down, and, and repeating himself. And sometime, about 4 o'clock in the morning, he got up and left. And he went, I guess, to Ketty. And what do you think he might have been, why do you think he needed to go down there? Well, I think that maybe he knew where Tina was. I think that maybe he left some evidence there that he had to get rid of. We went to the, the smart residence, and with their permission, searched the residence in an outbuilding, uh, looking for any kind of clues that might, uh, you know, connect them to the crime. Um, and then the uh, Department of Justice uh, had some agents assigned to the case, and they uh, extensively interviewed both Bo and Martin, and, uh, and then myself and uh, Ken Shanks, uh, we interviewed them. Uh, we went to great detail to make sure in our own minds that uh, they were not involved. They were going through the cupboards. Um, Marty was a, he was a, a, a chef and he had all kinds of knives and so forth. They found, uh, I guess they found like duct tape, uh, they found his knives and stuff. I think one was missing or something. They found a hangman's noose that was way up on top. They found uh, Hustler magazines that I didn't even know existed. They found a jacket down under the house that belonged to Tina that had some blood on it. They also found the kids, the kids had, there was a little shack just up the road and uh, from our cabin and the kids had a little clubhouse type thing in there. And the police, when I went out to get some clothing, uh, the, uh, the detectives uh, and the sheriff, some deputies that met me out there and we went up to the clubhouse and uh, I noticed something that I know wasn't like that before, and I questioned whether Tina might have been held there because the floorboards were torn up. And I know the kids didn't do it. We asked. And it wasn't like that when I had been out there that weekend. But the floorboard was tore up, and we kind of wonder if maybe that's where Tina had been. Marty was always calling on the phone um, with little tidbits of information. Normally they were things that were designed to throw the suspicion somewhere else. Yeah, there were several things that uh, brought some suspicion to Tina. Um, the fact that uh, the wires that were used to tie the boys uh, came from Tina's bedroom. Of course, she shared that with Sue. Um, and then in doing a, an examination of everything in the house, uh, we learned that uh, a shoebox that had been made in, as a school project uh, was missing from the kitchen. And uh, we, we found that really strange. There was nothing else really missing from the house other than that shoebox. And we learned that Tina had a real liking or a fixation 
on that tube or that shoe box. And uh, we just assumed that when she left, that that shoe box went with her. And uh, to my knowledge, that shoe box has never been recovered. I believe it to be approximately two days after the crime occurred. I was talking to my brother, and this is a story that my mother tells me. I was speaking with my brother, and I was telling him some details, uh, or talking, not details, I was talking to him about the crime. Casey and Justin were playing on the floor. I remember that. I don't remember what day. It was just right after it, though. And I caught Justin saying, no, Casey, you have to do it this way. And he was having Casey stab him. He said, because I, I have to stop your arm. And, I, and so Casey was supposed to try and stab him, and, and then he would grab his arm to stop him. And then I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and, and Justin was saying, I have to protect Sue, I have to protect Sue. And then Marty, he grabbed Justin, and he jerked him up, and he said, you will never talk about this again ever and he took him outside and I don't know what was said to Justin outside but Justin didn't talk to about it again after Marty threatened him is when he shut everything down up to that point he was talking to Doug but then when Mar I think Marty I think Marty caused him to to forget because we are almost certain he knew that Tina was gone. He knew she was missing. He knew that the female out there was Sue. He knew that it was Johnny. He knew that it was Dana. All of the blood, the glass, all of that. He could describe all that stuff. So either he walked to the scene after the fact, or he could have been standing. The way it was situated, he could have been standing in the little hall next to the doorway and could have seen it all. Tina would have had to come all the way down the hall where he was. And his tennis shoes, they took his tennis shoes and, and they, they told me that there was evidence that he had walked through the scene on those tennis shoes. We don't know what happened to those tennis shoes. The Kitty homicide has always been a uh, an important case as far as I was concerned that got didn't get as much attention as I think it should have. How I found out about Tina was my kids went to church and they found out about it at church. And just as soon as they could get to a telephone, they called me and told me what had happened. We were on a trip with my youth group in California when my foster dad, who was also one of the youth leaders, took myself and my cousins aside and informed me that they found Tina. And at that time we were, you know, I got all excited. Well, where is she? Can we see her now? And come to find out she was dead. The condition of her body at the time that was discovered left very little for us to, to uh, use to determine, you know, what may or may not have happened to her. There were some skeletal remains, and that was it. Uh, 
and those didn't produce anything like um, knife cuts on the bones or crushed in skull or something like that. None of that was present. So still today, we're, I don't think we can honestly say what she actually died from. Who was she? Who was Tina? She was an 11, 12-year-old girl who lived here in Keddie, California for a very short time and attended school in Quincy. Um, that was, I mean, there's 12 years of history here somewhere. There's a little girl who had a life before she was murdered. I did go back to Quincy in the late 80s to visit um, some friends and then I also at that time went and visited my mom and everybody's grave. And I noticed at that time, Tina had a little tin plaque that disappointed me greatly knowing that mom and Johnny had a decent one, but Tina didn't. And there was nothing I could do at that time to fix it. First of all, thanks everybody for, for coming to this. It has been a long time coming for Tina. Um, Tina, as you guys can tell, she's our little angel. She has always, I, I know, looked over us and our family helped us get where we are today. And this is also to help Tina put her at rest. She didn't have this. She was a joy. I miss her. She was my best friend. I miss my sister. And I want everybody to know that she's well loved and she's in our hearts. She always will be. She's looking over us and in our prayers. Um, thank you again, everybody. I don't know that I have a whole bunch to say, but Sue was my, her name is Glenna, and mine is too. It's, that was odd anyway, but she was called Sue, and I was her best friend, and all my children and all her children were like brothers and sisters. They lived at my house or her house, <laughs> and Tina and, and all of them. And Johnny was my boy's best friend, but he, I mean, he was like one of my own children, and so was Sheila. And Sheila and I have a special bond because Sheila has a daughter named Melissa. She's here somewhere. And that is also my granddaughter. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't meet her until today. So anyway, this happened a long, long time ago. And you know, the image kind of drifts out of your mind, but you don't ever forget, never. And all the horror that that child must have went to, I, I just, and I'm glad they found her, and I'm glad it's coming to a closure.
Okay, we've kind of moved it a little bit, but and I think you've seen it before. But the timeline pretty much starts here with, um, look at the date that it actually starts. It even has stuff mentioned from June of 1980 and then starts working through with, you know, some of the victims involved and other, you know, people that could be involved to where it reaches, um, find it. You know the time that the homicide occurs, and then some of the investigation that was done afterwards. And now, where would it start back in June? I think just where just some information they got while the investigation was going on that just may kind of set the stage for certain things or possibilities. They released him from jail. He was told not to come around the Meeks' house, not to notify me. He was told basically, get out of town. I've got to back up a little bit. You know, my daughter was living with us for a while. She was terrified of him, and I didn't know this. But she ran away, and she went back up to Oregon with her stepmother because of him. And after all this happened, she received a phone call up there and she does not know who called her. But it was the same night that, uh, well, the next night after it happened, she received a phone call up there telling her that she could be next if she didn't keep her mouth shut, which scared her to death. She has no idea who it was that called, because at that point they didn't even know anything about it up there. Uh, I received a postcard, and this was many months later, like six, seven months later, I received a postcard uh, saying all it said was, Bo is dead. Marty. That's all it said. I don't know how he died. I know that it, it came from Portland, Oregon. I'm assuming that's where they were at. It, it's just the idea that uh, at least two people committed this crime. and. And it's just bothersome to know that they're still not apprehended, uh, that they're still out there. Uh, if they were capable of, of committing such a heinous crime um, in, in 81, like you say, 22 years ago, um, you know, it's just amazing that they haven't committed some other ones since then. Mm -hmm. 